welcome you to St. John's United Church. This is the fifth Sunday of Easter. I hope I remembered that correctly. I believe it's the fifth Sunday of Easter. I'd like to just talk a little bit, though, before we begin. Uh, someone was kind enough to send me some, some feedback on what's working and what's not working in this. Even though we've been doing this for over a year, I'm still learning some of the things. So please, if you have any suggestions, some I'm, I might be able to implement, some I can't. But I do know last week there were some that were bothered by the, the movement, so I think I've fixed that problem. Uh, let me know. Let me know if this works better. Things will be a little bit different this week. Not, not major, but enough that you might notice some differences. So hopefully that helps everyone, it's because this is really about hearing God's word in the way, best way we can is to worship God through the, the music, through the scriptures, and through the message. So I hope this does help. May the Lord be with you. O oh, sing a new song to the Lord, for he has worked wonders. In the sight of the nations he has shown his deliverance. Alleluia. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, constantly accomplish the Paschal mystery within us, that those you were pleased to make new in holy baptism may, under your protective care, bear much fruit and come to the joys of life eternal. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever.
1 John chapter 4 and verses 7 to 21. Dear friends, let us love one another because love comes from God. Whoever loves is a child of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And God showed his love for us by sending his only Son into the world so that we might have life through him. This is what love is. It is not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the means by which our sins are forgiven. Dear friends, if this is how God loved us, then we should love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in union with us, and his love is made perfect in us. We are sure that we live in union with God, and that he lives in union with us, because he has given us his Spirit. And we have seen and tell others that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If we declare that Jesus is the Son of God, we live in union with God, and God lives in union with us. And we ourselves know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. Love is made perfect in us in order that we may have courage on the judgment day, and we will have it because our life in this world is the same as Christ's. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. So then, love has not been made perfect in anyone who is afraid because fear has to do with punishment. We love because God first loved us. If we say we love God but hate others, we are liars. For we cannot love God whom we have not seen if we do not love others whom we have seen. The commandment that Christ has given us is this. Whoever loves God must love others also. Holy Gospel of John, chapter 15, and verses 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
mother is waking up her son. Son is sleeping, dead asleep. You got to get up. You're going to be late. The son buries his head in the, in the pillow and says, I don't want to go. Mother says, but, but you got to go. And he says, but I don't want to. I, I don't like it there. Uh, it's boring. And the people don't like me. The mother says, but son, you have to go. It's Sunday and you're the minister. Well, believe it or not, sometimes even ministers don't like going to church. I don't always want to go to church. Even my adulthood, but especially when I was a teenager, I really didn't like going to church. My mother would bribe me with the roast beef dinner, I believe it was. Um, I don't remember all of these things. Sometimes my mother tells me these later, but uh, she would bribe me and, and I would actually go along with it because I loved a roast beef dinner. I love good food and she makes a great roast beef. And so I was persuaded to go, but that didn't mean I wasn't bored still when I got there. How many teenagers get bored at church? And I would try to find unique ways to entertain myself, some which I wouldn't suggest. I do remember that one time I was shooting spitballs at other parishioners. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it didn't go over well. I got in a lot of trouble, as I should have. And so that wasn't one of my better, better moments in life. So I tried to find other ways to entertain myself. And one thing that there's always in a pew is a Bible. So I started reading the Bible because I was bored with everything else. So I just start reading the Bible. And then I came across this fascinating book, the Apostle John, the, the Revelation of the Apostle John. We, we usually call it Revelations, although technically it's Revelation, but it's okay whatever term we use there. And I just found this book amazing. I have probably read more from the book of Revelation because of how much I read it back then, every week in church, probably read it more than any other book of the Bible. But I didn't just read it, I was so intrigued by it that I actually started to study about it and read other books about it. One of them, if I remember it uh, correctly, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Now, it, some people would see, see this a little bit more extreme, and certainly I, although I still affirm that Jesus Christ will return again, I wouldn't subscribe to many of the, the more extreme views that are, are represented there. But I'm still very thankful for that book. You might ask, well, why? The reason I'm so thankful for that book is it, it actually put a dread or a fear of God into me. And this is a good thing in this case because I then started to do more research. I started to, to study about God. I started to seek God, search out these things. And eventually it helped me to grow in my faith and I came to love God. And it started with fear. There's a passage which we read, Psalm 111, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I think the fear that's talking, being talked about here is not um, a, a fear of punishment. It's actually probably a dread or an awe, a respect. Because I'll get into that in a moment. There's different types of fears. But for me, it was probably more at that time about punishment. But that still didn't make it a bad thing at that moment. God can take what isn't always good and, and bring good from it. And I believe he did in that case, because although the beginning, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, I also learned it isn't the end of wisdom. I think that's why we skip ahead, if you like, to, to 1 John, which we read, perfect love casts out fear. As I began to search about God, as I began to realize that God loved me, I found that my fear subsided. It lessened. And I think that was because of understanding God's love. So each of us come to the, the scriptures and that with these, these concerns and these ideas. So how does fear and love relate? I think we need to begin by, by looking at what fear is, the definition of fear. Because fear can include many different things. It's actually very much like love in this respect. Because if you, I don't know if you're aware, but in the New Testament, our translation, the word for love, there's actually four different Greek words for love in the New Testament. The, the Greeks actually had even more than that. But they have in the New Testament four different words. They understood that not every love is the same. And although we have one word often just for love, we know that as well. I mean, think about it. If um, we use the phrase, we love ice cream. I love ice cream. I love my child. That's not the same type of love, and I think we all know that. 
In fact, it better not be the same type of love because it wouldn't be good if, we, if our love for ice cream was the same as how we loved our children. And the same can be said about fear, and I probably won't give you all the different ones that there are, but there's a very, to start, there's a very pragmatic idea of fear. Fear is that being afraid of punishment, being afraid of, of harm, and that's probably when we would use the word afraid. I'm afraid in that sense. But there's also fear of the unknown of the future. A lot of people would use the word angst in that, in that context. Angst is that, that unknown fear of, of what could happen overall. Just angst of, of the world seems a bad place type thing. But that's a type of fear. There's also a fear, anxiety is a form of fear. We don't, we don't think of it in those terms, but that's really what it is. Anxiety is a fear. It's another fear of the unknown in a sense. And most of us experience anxiety in one form or another. When we first went to school, when we go for a job interview, when we're first meeting people, most of us experience some elements of anxiety. There are some people, though, who experience a great deal of anxiety, and it affects them so much it affects how they live, and, and that's when it gets really bad, right? And, and maybe some of you experience that. Well, how does this answer those problems? There's another one, though. Before we get to that, there's another one that I often think of. I would, I would argue that the low self-esteem or low self-worth, although not a fear in itself, leads to or is revealed by fear. That's when we would be afraid of what people think of us. You know, we have this low self-esteem and then we get worried what other people are thinking about us. That's another type of fear. And the, the way to overcome this, the way I hope that I can help you in discovering how love overcomes this, is by considering how we fight it. Because the truth is that you cannot fight fear directly usually. Not, not normally. This isn't the best way, at least, to fight it. And you may be thinking, well, that's odd too, but I'm going to go to what I have as the sermon title here. It's actually a quote from uh, a man, uh, Ip Man is his name. He's a martial artist. Uh, there was a movie based on his life. And he says in this movie, I don't know if he said it in real life, but in the movie he says, one must strive not to strive. One must strive not to strive. Well, that doesn't make sense at first, at least for most of us. Well, if you're striving not to strive, aren't you still striving? But I think he meant it in a different way. It's really more to be a paradox. Is the thing that we're striving for, the effort we're making, is, is to leave aside all that type of striving we normally do. There are other paradoxes like that. I mean, obviously, think about this. If you want to overcome worry, say you have a problem with worrying a lot, which is another form of anxiety, right? Fear. You want to overcome worry. How is that going to help if you worry about worrying? Isn't that just going to make it worse? It will. Jesus had paradoxical, paradoxical statements. Uh, he said, if you, love, if you try to save your life, you will lose it. If you tr lose your life for my sake in the gospel, you will save it. That's a paradoxical statement. It's, it doesn't seem like it could be true because... Isn't it better to try to save your life? But in fact, when you give it up, that's when you actually end up saving it. In the same manner, this idea of striving not to strive is that we need to learn that I think a mistake we make as Christians is that we try to fight the vice or the bad we have instead of focusing on the good, the good action or the good thought. Do you see what I'm saying with this? When we focus our attention on fighting that, Another way to put this is we have to learn not to fight our anxiety, not to fight those things, because in the actual fighting of it, it makes it worse. Because sometimes maybe you have been trying to fight anxiety or uh, some other fear, and as you're fighting it, you, you realize that you maybe you didn't succeed at it, and that happens a lot. And then, so then we we start saying bad things about ourselves. We'll say, well, maybe I'm worthless. Maybe I'm, I don't have the willpower. And we beat ourselves up and then that anxiety or fear becomes worse. Instead, what we should be doing is focusing our minds elsewhere. That, that is what the idea of perfect love casts out fear. It's focusing our minds and our hearts somewhere else. When we strive not to strive, 
we're actually making an effort not to worry about the things we worry about, not by thinking about them, but by thinking about something else. Consider the, the idea of, of people who worry about, and I think most of us do as parents, our children going out. Say you have a teenager and they go out on a regular basis and they're out at late hours at night, an older teenager, but, but we get worried about them, right? And for some people, this can become overwhelming, this worry, that we just worry constantly about them. Even though all of us know, if you look statistically, you know that more often, than, way more often than not, they're going to come home safe. On rare occasions, something happens. Maybe it happens a little bit more in your family, but even families where it happens a lot, a lot is like, you know, two, three times a year type thing at the most, I would think. Maybe it's more, you can tell me if it is, but most of us never, never in a year, never in two years, but we worry about what might be instead of realizing that more often than not, everything's fine. So then we could, we could say, well, we'll pray about it, and that's a good thing too. Prayer is, is commanded by us in, in the scriptures, pray without ceasing. But I've had people come to me and say to me, well, I've been praying about not worrying, and I keep praying about it and keep praying, and God doesn't take it away. And I'll say to them as the minister, I'll say, well, stop praying about it. Now, you might be going, well, why are you, why are you saying that as a minister? Because in this case, that prayer isn't a good prayer. You're just worrying your prayers. You're worrying your thoughts, and they're becoming worse. Instead, I would suggest you pray something like this. Let's go back to that example of a teenager. You, you pray. For sure you pray. You say, God... And you might even acknowledge your worry. I'm worried about my child. You know I get worried about my child. And I know you tell me not to worry about my child. So here's what I'm doing. I'm coming to you and I'm just saying, I'm giving my child into your loving care. And I trust now that you love, love my child. And so I will stop. I'm leaving you now with my child. And then Focus on a, a different type of prayer, maybe a, pray, a praise or thanks to God, or go do something else completely. And if that thought comes back, and it will, by the way, don't worry about that. There's a little humor in that. Don't worry about that. It will come back because that's how our brains tend to work. We remind ourselves that God loves our child, that God loves us. That is how perfect love casts out fear. It's by focusing on the reality of God's love for us. And so that all those ways of fearing, fearing punishment from God, fearing these things, God doesn't want to punish anyone. The desire of God is to save everyone. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. I can't know that. You can't know that. Only God can know that. But what I can know is that God desires to save all. God wants the well-being of all. And I think if you, if you start practicing these, this is a very practical thing that you can do if you are having problems in this area with any type of fear, is that as we begin to focus and learn about God, learn about God's love, day by day, a little bit at a time, we will begin to gradually have that fear subside. And once in a while, you may even find that you have no fear for a time, no anxiety, no worry. Of course, that's the moment where you start going, well, maybe I'm not used to this. So you go back to your old habits. Remind yourself again of God's love. Remind yourself again of what God desires, your good. And may you grow in that grace. Perfect love casts out fear. Strive not to strive. Let that go and allow God's love to overflow in your life, and in the lives of those around you. The Lord be with you. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? 
when Jesus is my portion. A constant friend is he. His eye, his own, the sparrow. And I know he watches me. I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy, and I sing because. And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches. I know he watches. Creator of the universe, you made the world in beauty and restore all things in glory through the victory of Jesus Christ. We pray that wherever your image is still disfigured by poverty, sickness, selfishness, war, and greed, the new creation in Jesus Christ may appear in justice, love, and peace. To the glory of your name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Oh,